Hi, welcome back to Integrated Rangeland Management here at the University of Idaho, and today we're going to talk about rangeland recreation. I'm Karen Launchbaugh, as you probably know, and I'm here today with Jake Price. Well, tell us about yourself, Jake. What do you do? Well, I'm a graduate student here at the University of Idaho. I'm currently working on a restoration ecology project. Um, I do have an undergraduate degree, though, in uh, uh, conservation social sciences, so I have a bit of a background in... Um, recreation and its effects on the landscape. Yeah, you did some conservation planning classes and things like that where you looked at recreation. Good. Yeah, so I've done a couple of those. Excellent. Well, tell us about rangeland recreation. That's kind of a new field. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> recreation is certainly nothing new on rangelands, but it is increasing. Um, uh, partially due to a change in the types of recreation. Um, there's this upward trend in thrill-based activities like rock climbing and base jumping that are beginning to take over or take hold. Um, increases you know, in technology, technological advances uh, like GPSs, phone apps, off-road vehicles have also begun to allow for new types of recreation to take hold on rangelands. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite a lot different than it was 50 years ago or so. A lot, lot yeah. of new, new options, yeah. yeah. I mean, things... Things that were going on 50 years ago, like hunting, um, camping, hiking, horseback riding, those are still, um, they still have a very strong presence on rangelands, um, and they're growing, but um, there are certainly new recreation, new recreational activities that are taking place now. Yeah, and hunt, hunting is maybe the one exception where it's, a, there's, well, maybe at one time hunting wasn't a recreation, and then it became a recreation, yes. and it's really changed. They're um, not as much, it's still a really important recreation form, but not as much hunting as there used to be, right? No. Yeah. So, <clears throat> part of the reason for this increasing trend in recreation would be, uh, to some extent, due to this urbanization of um, of our, our, our cities. Uh, we have these increased um, presence of people from cities now on rangelands um, that are looking for that outdoor experience. Uh, they didn't grow up on farms or ranches, um, and they're looking to get out of the city and create these connections with the land, which is extremely important, um, you know, from a management perspective, um, getting people out onto the rangeland and getting them out there recreating so that they can create these connections with the land is extremely important. Um, yeah, forward. absolutely. Like, you know, 50, 70 years ago, a lot of people had grown up on a ranch or had a cousin from a ranch or, or uncles and aunts. And that's very, un that's actually quite uncommon now to have yeah. a connection through agriculture. But because we become more urbanized, this is sometimes the only way that people really develop that kind of love or connection or understanding of the land is through recreation. Yeah. So, so this is like become becoming some people's only output. They're only they're only uh Exactly. So in the uh, Richard Knight paper, he talks a little bit about recreation be economically potent. And if you guys can just think for a second or two about some of the pros and cons that he might have meant when he when he said that recreation could be economically potent that'd be great some pros some pro, some pros some economic pros of recreation would be um recreation tends to bring a lot of money into the community um for example you know bringing people out of the urban areas and out into the rural areas you know um yeah, some little towns where hunting or fishing is big. That the the main thing that happens at the at the general store is buying fishing licenses and hooks and stuff like that. Yeah, so it can yeah. really bring it in from the city into the, out to the country. Yeah, so that's a great example. Yeah, moving money around, um, resources for land management agencies and resource improvement. Um, you know, a lot of the money that comes in from recreation from recreation is um, you know um, camping fees, park fees. You know, and a lot of this money, you know, it goes to the land management agency and the land management agency can use it for resource improvement, hardening resources, building trails, putting in, you know, services and whatnot. Um, resource, recreation is also, um, you know, a, a significant income for uh, businesses and enterprises. You know, people come from all around, you know, um, to see places like for instance, like Carlsbad Caverns, you know, Carlsbad, you know, the surrounding area is not, you know, um, a large city by any means, but people come from all around into that area, you know, to, to view Carlsbad Caverns, you know, they bring all their money with them. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. 
some cons. Um, recreation, income from recreation can be highly variable. It's seasonal, you know. In the, in the summer months, we see a big peak in uh, recreation dollars, you know. And kind of another um, maybe not so well-known uh, fluctuation in re recreation income would be, you know, it's a re reflection of the economy. When the economy is good, you know, people people are in their cars and they're driving places, they're going places for recreation. And when it's when the economy is not so good, you know, they're they're sitting at home eating macaroni and cheese. Yeah, right. Short term and long term. Mm -hmm. Short term and long term. So um, recreation income. The other the funny thing about recreation income is also that you know most of that income is in sales tax. You know, so a lot of that is you know. Um, yeah, buying things when they're in town and, yeah. Buying um, things when they're in town. Um, so not exactly property taxes. You know, the money from property taxes goes towards building roads and schools and providing infrastructure and whatnot for a city. So, um, yeah, it's sort of a short-term income versus sort of that long-term foundational funding that keeps counties and, and little towns alive. So yeah. that's a little different kind of money. Yeah. Um, you know, and then the other, you know, when you start looking at the jobs that recreation creates, you know, they're not, they're not exactly uh, for, they're not exactly permanent positions. You know, a lot of times these recreation jobs are for younger people and they're more short term or seasonal. Yeah, great summer jobs, but they're not the long term to build yeah, you, a family on. You don't yeah. want to be, you don't want to be, you know, guiding yeah. trips in the middle of the winter. Yeah, and there, there's, there's certainly exceptions to that, but in general, mm -hmm. I would, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the one of the major issues um, that is uh, one of the major issues with recreation that's often seen is that recreationists are they perceive their actions as being benign. Um, they they can see the cumulative impacts of other recreationists, you know, so leaving trash behind and tearing up trails, but they can't exactly. Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, yeah, there. it's like they, they can't see their individual impact, but yeah. the but the whole the cumulative impact of everybody yeah. is noticeable. So they can't really see what part they had in that. They don't associate their yeah, their selves right. with that that cumulative impact, right. which is interesting. Yeah, um, many people just don't realize um, the impact that recreation has on the land, or that can have on the land. Um, in specific types of recreation, the impacts of specific types of recreation vary. Um, some can be very damaging, you know and others can be quite benign. Yeah, exactly, right. So real quick, um, before we get into too much more of this, we'll talk about the difference between, you know, extractive uses versus amenity uses. Um, you know, extractive uses are the removal of something from the environment. For example? Like hunting or fishing, you know, um, going out and, you know, maybe picking fruit or something just to, to some extent. I mean, well, no, yeah. Well, one time in class, someone said that, um, that a connect firewood would be recreation. I thought, wow, if you consider firewood collecting recreation, some, more power to you. Some people have a lot of fun. That's like the, that's like the big family vacation on the weekends. But that would be extractive. That would be opposed, extractive. As opposed to amenity. Amenity is more or less enjoyment. Um, you know, you're, you're bird watching, you're, you're going out and you're camping. You're just looking to get out of town for the weekend. You um, bet. Um, you know, but both of these still have um, a varying degrees of impact. Um, and education plays a role in that. Um, both extractive and amenity can have a very extreme impact on um, resources, um, but they can also have a very low level, very low levels of impact. You know, and it's all just based on uh, education. Um, you know, and again, it's kind of important to, uh, what is, what is it well, yeah, just, uh, the, again, just going back to that point that you made earlier, which is sometimes this is the only contact people yeah. have with nature. So that, that's a, an important kind of side benefit so, of both extractive and amenities. Yeah. So we, we, you know, we as managers, we want people out there, but we know that we need to educate them. Yes. You know? some positive impacts that recreation can have on the landscape. You know, maybe you guys can think for a second or two, maybe come up with three or four Right, yeah, ideas. we already talked about economic, but now we're talking about, so what about some of the maybe positive the ecological. ecological, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the first couple are economic, but, you know, um, the economics, the money that's brought in from recreation benefits the local community, you know, and that money 
can be used by federal agencies to improve and protect resources. And it doesn't exactly doesn't necessarily need to be a federal agency. You know, there are a lot of small working groups. That could small, be a county park would be the same. Yeah. County park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, small working groups, small local working groups that you know use that money to improve and protect resources. You know, and then. Anytime you can use money to harden a resource, you know, and when I'm talking about hardening a resource, I'm talking about, you know, laying down a asphalt for a, a bike trail or adding wood chips, you know, something as simple as adding, you know, cedar wood chips to a trail, you know, just to kind of reduce impact on that trail, you know, that money is well spent. Um, education to increase awareness and connection to the land, that's, that's a big one. I think for myself, um, because you need people on the land developing that connection or when time comes around to make policies concerning that that source or that site you know if people don't have a connection they don't care that's exactly right well said <laughs> you know um and anytime you can create that connection and educate at the same time yeah. you know that's the best um trails you know anytime you create a trail for people I think it's important to realize that people are not the only ones using that. Yeah, trail. it's kind of a weird benefit of trails, but yeah. I've seen a lot of livestock and wildlife use those trails too. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of, a lot of different uses on those trails. Um, weed, weed and fire monitoring is another pretty, pretty interesting one as far as a positive impact. You know, um, we have a lot of these uh, cool apps now for your phone, so you can report fires or weed outbreaks using apps on your phone and. That would go straight to either you know a county weed board member or um, or the fire the rural know, fire department rural department, fire department yeah. you know and those those uh, those apps are basically you know they're they only work if recreationists are using them um, you know and then kind of back up to the top where we start talking about monitoring and dumping of trash you know the self policing idea. Um, Having these small kind of local working groups, the one that I like to use as an example is this uh, um, this mountain biking association here in Moscow. You know, um, they use a lot of the the funds that they receive for using their trails to go up there with volunteer groups and either build and repair trails or pick up trash. You know, yeah. and that's just one of those nasty. Um, Side, side effects of, of recreation is there's always going to be somebody dumping trash. So yes. having so these, these organizations to try to help out and bring people together, yeah. Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, helping them get out there and get some get rid of some of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, and then hunting and fishing, they do they do serve um, to kind of maintain fish and wildlife populations. Yeah, it's one of the few tools we have to maintain populations if they're getting out of control. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people that study wildlife management, they can use the number of tags they put off for an animal to change that uh, to some degree. Yeah. So now that we've looked at some of the positive effects of recreation, let's think about a couple of uh, the negative effects. So the negative effects, negative impacts of recreation can be, you know, something as, as bad as, you know, death of wildlife, abandonment of their young, um, you know, I think about birds, I guess, people messing with birds' nests, you know, birds have a tendency yeah, to yeah, abandon yeah. young. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know deer, deer fawns, they, they like to, they like to really hang out in, in grass, in tall grass, and they're very, very easy to for people to run over, well, which is the, sad to think about. Well, I know, but the fish, fish and game, they often talk about people see these these deer out there and they bring them into the office as if oh, these yeah. young fawns were... Uh, like they were homeless. Yeah, well, and now they are, you know, yeah, but homeless, yeah. <laughs> it happens. It totally happens. Uh, another, you know, really bad one would be this attraction of animals to people, which is, you know, I wouldn't say it's the most negative, but I mean, it's extremely negative. You know, any time where you have an animal that is becoming habituated to people, it becomes a, a threat to some extent. I mean, either to itself or to the, the recreationist, you know, if that animal is coming into campsites, um, you know, there's, there's a pretty good chance that either A, it'll hurt a recreationist or B, um, that animal will have to be removed at yeah, some point. Yeah, that's the hip situation you talked about, right? Yeah. Um, people introduce fire, people introduce weeds, you know, um, 
I would say recreation is in weeds. That's a pretty bad one. Yeah, they, they carry it on their on your clothing down on the trail and fire. How many fires do we hear about every year that were started from a campfire that didn't mm-hmm. go out? Human caused fires are a big issue nowadays mm-hmm. in the West. Um, erosion and compaction. You know, that's that's a that's a that that comes from people usually getting off trail. Um, you know, whether it be motorized um, recreation or non motorized recreation. You know, trails are created to try and focus that erosion and that compaction and every time you whenever you go off trail you kind of increase uh yeah. increase the likelihood that erosion or compaction will occur you know and then when we start looking at time of year uh later in the year when it's drier and people are getting off trail you get a lot of erosion and earlier in the year when it's wet and we get people going off trail you get a lot of compaction so i mean those can be um time of year dependent <clears throat> uh water contamination is another big one um, you know, people using the bathroom too close to water sources has been yeah, the one that yeah. I've had a hard time with. Um, you know, on river trips and stuff, they have it's a on river issue. trips. You know, whenever you use like a, a wild and scenic river corridor, <clears throat> they require that all of that human waste is is carried out. Um, but it just doesn't happen all the time, which is a sad fact. Yep. And uh, then, see, I just want, you, you talked in class about this altering the habitat through this human browse line. Mm-hmm. And we think we've all seen that when pe- at a campground where people, they, well, yeah. You, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, you hike all day and you get to a campsite and you want to, you know, you want to start a fire. So, what's the first thing you do is you start walking around camp and you start ripping off every twig that you can <laughs> get your hands on. Um, and pretty soon it decimates the whole. Pretty soon, you know? yeah. Um, all right um so looking at the impacts of recreation on wildlife uh this was a a study by richard knight um out of colorado and he was looking at the effects of hikers on mule deer and basically what he was looking at was the 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 differences between pedestrian alone on trail pedestrian alone off trail and then pedestrian with dog and what he saw was that you know pedestrian alone on trail tended to have a really low probability um of flushing the mule deer but as soon as that pedestrian alone moved off trail the probability of flushing increased and then once he added the dog to the situation um, the probability of flushing increased dramatically yeah that's pretty interesting and then you know this is Richard Knight again and he was looking at the Vesper Sparrows and this was done about the same time as the mule deer study and it shows pretty much the same same trends uh, pedestrian alone versus uh, pedestrian with a dog Um, one of the funny points of this one would be the, this top right graph, which shows the dog alone on trail, which had, uh, pretty much the lowest probability of flushing compared to all the other. And he attributed that to the dog alone, just not being a considerable uh, threat to the Vesper Sparrow. The Vesper Sparrow probably didn't view the dog alone as a considerable predator. That's interesting. Um, one more Richard yeah, Knight. Yeah, this is a little, it's a little more confusing, but walk us through it. A little bit more confusing. This is Richard Knight again. He's looking at um, the effect of mountain bikers versus hikers. So we have our black bar being hikers and our gray bar being mountain bikers. And then he looked at three different species. So it was bison on the far left and antelope on the far right. And then he had two deer studies in the middle. One was um, with a person, a pedestrian on trail, and the other one was a pedestrian off trail. Um, so starting up at the top with alert distance, which is just the distance from the trail or from the pedestrian that, from the recreationist, that the animal became alert. So we see on the left, um, the bison, they didn't become alert, you know, they didn't become too alert at a, at a very near distance. Um, however, antelope on the far right, they became very alert at even an extreme distance. Yeah. Um, and deer, they were kind of somewhere in the middle, but they were pretty... Uh, Pretty similar, both uh, on and off trail. So then we move down to flight distance would be the distance from the recreationist when the animal flushed. So we see, you know, on the left, again, bison, relatively indifferent. You know, they're just a big, powerful animal, and they just are not, they're not looking, they're not looking to run away. And then antelope on the other end of the spectrum, um, they're just getting out of town. You know, they, they are not looking to stick around. They don't want to really put up with too much recreation. 
you know, in deer again, they're somewhere in the middle. There's a slight difference between mountain biking and hiking, but not considerable. You said there. What, what was the difference between mountain biking and hiking that, that Dr. Knight thought? So the difference that that Dr. Knight was looking for, because if you look at all these these uh these bars that he has, there's really no difference between the mountain biking or the hiking, the effect on the animals at all, and he attributed that to um, both having kind of their own unique effect on the animals. Um, hiking, the person tends to retain their human form, you know, and if the animal associates fear with the human form, then they would associate that, you know, whereas the mountain biker kind of loses its human form, but they, tr they travel, you know, they, they can travel farther distances in a shorter amount of time and they kind of tend to sneak up on wildlife. Yeah, so. that's what we might have seen, just a small difference in that flight uh, with the deer, yeah. the mountain bike versus hiking, a little difference in form. And that was yeah. probably, it was just yeah. the difference in form. You know, and then we get down to distance moved, which is, you know, after the animal flushed, how far did it go? And we see the bison are just the same thing. They're just not going very far. And, you know, the pronghorn, um, you know, this time it was the deer. The deer moved the furthest um, when the pedestrian was off trail. And then pronghorn, you know, they moved, but not terribly far again. Yeah, these are probably all the same distance to be yeah. between deer and deer because there's a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think pronghorn, they just want to be able to see you and then they know they can outrun you. So. <laughs> That's probably it. So looking at how wildlife respond and adjust to recreation, you know, the, the way that we would look at this is learned responses, you know, the which would be avoidance, attraction, and habituation. You know, the animal initially is probably... Um, learns to just avoid people unless I would say there's something like food or scraps that the recreationists are using to feed the, the wildlife, you know, so that's when you start to get attraction and through attraction you get habituation, you know, and um, through extended durations of attraction and habituation, you can possibly begin to see something like a genetic response, which would be... Yeah, where you start to have whole populations just are genetically different if they're near humans and near kind recreation. Of, yeah, so they're inclined, yeah. Yeah. So talking about some management approaches that we can take to kind of lessen the impact that recreation has on the landscape or wildlife, um, you know, rest is a big one. Um, just closing off roads and trails, letting the landscape kind of... Uh, settle down a little bit, um, adjusting seasons of use, that's a big one. Um, you know, during the wetter portions of the year when the landscape is really susceptible to damage, just um, telling people that they can't be out there, you know, gives the landscape a chance to kind of... Um, yeah, in the same way we had seasons of grazing, now we have seasons of use for... Seasons, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then limiting the areas of activity, uh, you know... Like if you day have a, use only, right. Yeah. Day use only. You know, keeping people out of the water or off of the camping, keep people from keeping people from camping next oh, to the river. Or something would be another mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, other management approaches would be you know trying to change the intensity of use. You know, um, during certain times of the year, fire restrictions are really common, at least here in the Northwest. Um, you know, and then. I'm going to say it like this, but maintaining a good bad road. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, if the road is nice, people are going to drive it. If the road is bad, people are less inclined to, to take it. So, I mean, if you have sensitive sites that are off the road, you know, maybe just leaving the road alone is the best option. <laughs> um, limiting facilities, that's a big one. You know, a lot of people like to have you know, facilities nearby for when they need to be used. Um, if those facilities aren't there, they're less likely probably to stay. Um, using fees, you know. Yeah, and then the next one about foot traffic versus motorized, that changes everything if you let vehicles into something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then kind of like with limiting facilities, you know, you can attract people to certain areas also by providing facilities. Yeah, you know. that's right. So... You know, not to say that all of the the issues with recreation um, affect just the landscape. Uh, you know, there are these conflicts between recreationists that have become a, a great management concern. So, you know, motorized versus non-motorized um, four-wheelers and bird watchers, they don't tend to get along, you know, and then sound and litter. In the presence of other people, you know, there's a lot of people who are out on the landscape recreating who are out there for kind of the isolation factor of it all, you know, just the, the sheer presence of another person is upsetting to yeah, them. Yeah, or so. their litter that they left behind. You just don't want to see that. Yeah, yeah. people don't want to see that. So looking 
kind of into the future, you know, trying to uh, um, integrate livestock and recreation together, you know, bring them together, uh, you know, and it's kind of a, an opportunity or a spectrum, you know, some some forms of recreation, livestock are almost required, you know, the, the, the example that comes to my mind would be like a dude ranch or something where somebody is looking for a real Western experience, you know, livestock are expected. Without the livestock, it's just not the experience that they were looking for. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of people, you know, that are coming out of the cities nowadays and they are not exactly prepared for encounters with livestock they don't know how to react so um you know education will, will end up playing a huge role in this uh you know bringing these two together you know livestock and rest livestock and recreation you know um more on livestock and rec recreation but you know we can't deny that livestock do have a, an effect on recreationists you know this is a survey of uh, wilderness visitors, which is a little different. You know, your your typical wilderness visitor is not your your average recreationist. Yeah, they're but, they're really wanting to get away. They're going out into the wilderness. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, they're looking for isolation more than anything. You know, so seeing other visitors is is generally upsetting. But you know, seeing you know cattle, livestock in general. Um, yeah, it was interesting to me that in this case, the, the this study they found that livestock were worse than even seeing other people. Yeah, which is so funny. It surprises me, but but again, I, I you can't just assume that everyone just loves cows like I do. Mm -mm. <laughs> so I think that it's it's fair. This is the kind of data that just says you know, some people just really don't want that to be part of their experience. Yeah, and it, it might just be yeah that situation, just wilderness situation in general. Well, yeah, and no, I think it's pretty common. Most people would want to recreate without cows, except for those cases like you say that Western experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so going on into the future, you know, compromising, listening, understanding, education are going to become huge components of uh, recreation and livestock. Some ways, though, that we can manage for livestock with recreation, that, that, well, some ways that we've have shown fruitful managing livestock and recreation, you know, would be, uh, you know, just uh, education, educating um, ranchers, um, educating uh, recreationist, you know, so things like moving livestock away from recreation sites during uh, heavily used times of the year. So like July 4th, you know, a uh, rancher should probably not be moving his cattle through yeah. heavily recreated areas. Yeah, most ranchers I, I know that are pretty savvy about that. They, they realize there's just certain times that they're mm -hmm. just going to try to avoid having much activity at that time. You know, and then just this simple act of um, informing recreationists, you know, that grazing or livestock activities are occurring on a site, you know, um, I think makes them a little bit more comfortable with the presence of livestock in general. Yeah, in this picture, there's some um, some uh, uh, signs that can be gotten from the Idaho Rangeland Resources Commission, part of their care and share program. And they found that a lot of conflict is averted if you just put up a sign that says, hey, th these cattle are being managed mm -hmm. or, or these sheep do have guard dogs with them. So they're finding a lot less conflict just by helping people be informed about what's out there. Yeah, that's important. Um, you know, and then other, you know, new interesting uh, ways you know, uh, fencing, just fencing, you know, revising these fences, installing new cattle guards, um, these, uh, you know, just kind of reducing the number of yeah. gates. Because, I mean, that seems to be one of the major issues with recre between recreation and, and ranchers would be, you know, they don't seem to... Sh there always seems to be a gate that gets left open. Yeah, and oddly enough, a lot of people don't know how to close a gate, so even yeah. leaving instructions on how to close a gate sometimes is necessary, Yeah. which uh, seems kind of silly, but some people just, that's new to them. Seems silly, but... That's new to them. Um, you know, and then there's this other uh, interesting kind of idea of, like, uh, ranchers and uh, cowboys interacting with recreationists or the other way around, recreationists and cow... Rec recreationists interacting with cowboys and ranchers, you know. And it's not to say that... Uh, you know, every chance you get a rancher or a cowboy should interact with a recreationist or the other way around, but it's just, you know, it's an interesting idea and it doesn't doesn't exactly hurt. Right, well, the, the, cow, the ranchers I've talked to, they said that for when they first started talking to recreationists, when they'd see them, they, they expected them just to be mad about their way of life and their cows, and, and more often than not, they're very curious about it. So don't assume that just because that there's this divide between the two. So I am going to direct everybody to the Idaho Rangeland Resources Commission website, idrange.org, because they have some really good resources um, called the, in the Care and Share program, and they've been really uh, a national leader in trying to um, create opportunities for conversations and really use conflict between 
livestock uh, producers and recreationists. Hmm. So here we have a short, I think it's a six or seven minute video, um, Rangeland, on Rangeland recreation conflicts. Uh, this is this is a short video out of uh, Boise. I can't remember the yeah. Swimba, Swimba put it yeah, on. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. um, but it's a pretty interesting video. Um, you guys should give a look. Yeah, and then uh, if you look at the bottom of this uh, YouTube video, you'll see a link to this. So you can either write this down or just click the link on the YouTube video below. Yeah. So yeah, some couple questions just to think about as we leave you, you know, um, how can we use economic benefit, you know, so money gained from recreation to increase ecological benefit, you know, how can we use that money gained from recreation to improve the landscape, you know, and the other question would be, how can we use landscape improvements to increase recreation based income, you know, because that's a circle. They both got to come together. They yeah. both come together. You know, if the, if, the, if the landscape is not healthy, then people just don't recreate on it. And if people don't recreate on it, you know. They're not, they're not going to make that connection to the land. Not going to you know, make we, that connection. So, all right. Both those. Well, Jake, thanks for joining me today. And, uh, you know, we don't have all the answers. So if you uh, think of some, uh, drop a note or put a note on the web page. And, uh, and let us know at range at uidaho.edu. And keep recreating. Perfect.